as part of this uh, presentation, we're just going to be pointing to the map because we're talking about a number of countries where there have been U.S. wars, one after the other after the other, and that's why we passed out a few of these maps. Maps explain nothing about a people, about nationalities, ethnic, religious background, but they show an entire part of the globe where U.S. imperialism is determined to recolonize and where there are a series of extremely violent wars taking place. So many of us here know all too well, um, and we, we can switch back and forth to it, um, you know, if that's okay. Uh, Many of us here know all too well that the U.S. has the largest prison population in the world, the largest number of police murders, over a thousand a year, the largest number of racist attacks. And in the streets, all of us here have participated in so many, many of the important demonstrations of outrage against police murders. There's a total support here in Workers' World for the revolutionary demand of abolish the police. And it represents an understanding of the racist nature of the police. Regardless of body cams and training and new oversight, they only function as enforcers of capitalist property relations, relations based on wage theft, racism, sexism, and exploitation. We base it also on the confidence that people are able to organize their own lives and security without this massive apparatus of police and courts and prisons. It's a fundamental question, the armed forces of the state. And just as we say that the police never have any progressive role to play in society, and the justification for the police is always to create fear and division. And the role of the police also keeps constantly expanding because securing profit is its goal. And that profit is more and more tenuous. Now I raise abolish the police because around the world we also stand with those who call for abolishing NATO and U.S. armies, U.S. military, U.S. bases out and an end to U.S. wars, because the U.S. military around the world functions the same way, but even more violently, more viciously, than the police do in communities here. And the enormous level and the increasing level of police repression, of racism and violence, is also reflected in the increasing U.S. wars abroad. It creates social havoc, and it also creates what these social, uh, these pundits, media pundits today call failed states. That's their new word for the very creation that they themselves are responsible for. So tonight, we wanted to have a discussion on understanding U.S. imperialism's wars in the Middle East, Central Asia, and North Africa. That's a huge topic. I mean, how can we possibly cover that? The cost of the U.S. military machine is in the trillions and trillions of dollars and literally could remake life on this planet. And yet it has created the greatest division between rich and poor and the smallest handful in human history. Now in Western and Central Asia and in Africa, it's a part of the world where there's hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops that are concentrated. They've carried out invasions, occupations, hundreds of bases built, aircraft carriers, destroyers, jet aircraft, nuclear submarines, constant overflight and firing of Predator Jones. If you wanted to check or try to research just how many U.S. bases are around the world, there's no agreement. Uh, it's somewhere over a thousand. Some might argue it's 800 and some it's 1,300. Uh, it depends on whether they're count, counting forward positioning bases, what are called lily pads, which can expand into pop-up bases overnight. But it's an enormous military concentration. More than a thousand bases in 130 countries. 
And those are the countries that admit to a U.S. presence. There's tens of thousands of CIA and secret operatives and paid mercenaries, along with those U.S. troops. And also the U.S. military is supplemented with the military of all the old colonial powers and their racist military. That means Britain and France and Italy and Germany and now the captive countries of Eastern Europe. That's who makes up the NATO armies. Each of these wars also creates an army of collaborators and air agents and torturers from their own population. Now the Zionist State of Israel is of course a proxy for the U.S. Is to and a totally dependent partner in these wars, particularly in the Middle East. We should take note that Israel carried out more than 30 airstrikes within the last week in Gaza. So these wars continue even today totally defenseless. Gaza, really a concentration camp, surrounded. These wars also take place with the absolute participation of the corrupt monarchy in Saudi Arabia, another dependent partner. The U.S. runs the Saudi military and there isn't one Saudi plane that can take off or refuel or know its global positioning without U.S. military. That's how tight a hold, how short a leash they keep on the Saudi military. They pay for all this equipment, supposedly they own it, it's run by U.S military and contractors. And they're engaged in a vicious war in Yemen. It's created an uproar, the four hospitals run by Doctors Without Borders and several schools that were just recently bombed. And they couldn't have been bombed without who was supplying the GPS coordinates. Now there are currently official numbers, about 35,000 troops serving in 20 countries in the Middle East region. And in addition, as I say, there are these uncounted CIA and secret operatives, thousands of mercenaries. There are more mercenaries operating in Afghanistan, for example, than there are troops. And NATO forces, too. And it, there's also coordination with, with Turkey, with other proxies of the U.S. There's two and a half million U.S. troops who have cycled through Iraq and Afghanistan in the past 15 years of war, served at least one tour of duty. Bahrain has become home to the Navy's Fifth Fleet. There's a huge air installation in Qatar. Uh, at the height of the U.S.-led wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, there were actually a thousand U.S. military installations just in those two countries. Thank you, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's this tiny little dot of a peninsula right here. So we're, we were talking first about Afghanistan. We we're talking first about Afghanistan here in Central Asia, and I'll come back to why Afghanistan is so key. But then the importance of U.S. bases, and I'll talk about this a lot more, right here in the Persian Gulf, because this is the oil, richest oil area of the entire world, right here. So it is to create a lockdown. So across the Persian Gulf to the borders of Europe now are totally under the boot of U.S. NATO troops. There are U.S. bases in every country except Iran, Syria and Yemen. And that fact alone says a lot about the continuing sanctions on Iran despite every negotiation and the wars raging in Syria and Yemen. In the past 15 years, since 2001, U.S. imperialism has attacked 17 countries. That's in the last 15 years. So that's what we're dealing with tonight. And we don't have time to deal with, but we should at least mention or take up. We're not dealing with the wars of the 1990s when the U.S. absolutely destroyed Iraq and Yugoslavia. Or the wars of the 1980s when in Central America they armed the death squads and the Contra armies and created millions of refugees and immigrants. Or the wars from 1960 to 75 in Vietnam and Southeast Asia where millions were killed. Or the U.S. war in Korea in the 1950s. 
or World War II in the Asia Pacific and in Europe where U.S. imperialism emerged as the undisputed su superpower. So just taking steps back, we're not we're not even really touching on those wars. We could go all the way back to the first imperialist war outside U.S. borders in Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Philippines, back to 1898. But if we were going to say that, then we couldn't forget to mention the genocidal wars against the indigenous people and the slave trade and the wars that were created in Africa to fuel the slave trade. The point is that U.S. imperialism is a system that is built on war. It feeds on war. Its empire is built on the profits of its many wars. And the number of wars and the size of the military apparatus and the cost of the vast armada of ships and bases is actually growing. And that is a projection for more bases and an even expanding military. Now, the U.S. wars were not discussed by any of the bourgeois candidates, Republican or Democrat. Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, think about it. Donald Trump, except to make threats. But there was no real discussion about these wars. No condemnation anywhere. As a matter of fact, we had a year of endless talk about candidates without any mention of the U.S. wars, right? It was like off topic. Workers' World Party stands opposed to every one of these imperialist wars, historically and going on now. And we stand with the countries that are targeted by imperialism. But as I said, I want to deal with current wars since 2001, and I'm going to start with Afghanistan. The U.S. war in Afghanistan is the longest war in U.S. history that outside of U.S. borders. It's lasted 15 years right here. There's no end in sight. There have been troop surges, there have been drawdowns, there's been shifts and rotating tens of thousands of troops from its imperialist allies and its NATO members. And the war in Afghanistan has also been based on pitting the many different nationalities and ethnic groups and linguistic groups and religious differences that exist in Afghanistan against each other. Now Afghanistan by every United Nations measure is considered the poorest country in the world today in terms of illiteracy, subjugation of women, infant mortality, women's mortality in childbirth, preventable diseases of tuberculosis and venereal disease and malaria and common infections, pneumonia. In the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan, it was just the latest stage of the wars in that country. The United States has been involved in Afghanistan since 1979 and through the 1980s, through the CIA, in organizing with assistance from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan under military dictatorship, those fanatical mercenary units determined to overturn the Afghan revolution. And these Contra forces were known as the Mujahideen. From them sprung Al-Qaeda and all the forces today. And from that policy of consciously arming absolutely reactionary groups. It's a policy that goes back, by the way, to President Eisenhower, who urged that the CIA, in fighting left movements, always stressed that their forces were engaged in a, quote, holy war. And as now with, with ISIS and al-Nusra in Syria, these extremist forces in Afghanistan had no interest in solving problems. Their only interest was in wrecking, in pulling down, in stamping out, any possibility of social change, any possibility of progress or of an independent sovereign state. Now, in October of 2001, when President Bush, uh, the U.S. military, roared in and occupied the country, what was it that they said at the time? 
They, they said Afghanistan is desperately poor. We're going to absolutely rebuild and modernize it. We're going to set up schools and hospitals and infrastructure. There were endless articles about how poor Afghanistan was and what a huge difference they were going to make in the liberation of women. Do you remember this? Now, they did build Afghanistan from the ground up with U.S. bases. They built hundreds hundreds of U.S. bases. Uh, there are more than 258 that I could count just on the internet, just looking at the names of the bases. Air bases, forward operating bases, main operating bases, combat outposts, fire bases, patrol bases, and on and on and on. As I said, a million U.S. soldiers have served at least one tour of duty in Afghanistan. A million and a half in Iraq. Now, why is U.S. imperialism staying in Afghanistan? It's strategically important for U.S. global domination. It borders Iran, and we're coming to Iran, considered an enemy since the 1979 Iranian Revolution. It borders several Soviet republics, right here, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. It borders Pakistan. Extre extremely important, a little piece to China. So it's also now a major hub of a new string of bases that are going to be built in the heart of Central Asia. This is why there's no expectation, no hope of U.S. troops leaving. Afghanistan. It's a population that's desperately poor, but it has very rich resources. And it's also one of the richest sources of war profits. The U.S. military industries and military contractors. And therefore, to U.S. banks. And war is super profits. Now, let's move just for a minute to Iran. U.S. imperialism loved Iran when Iran was ruled by an absolute monarch and it helped to organize the military forces to control the Persian Gulf. Iran and Israel on the Mediterranean Sea at the entry of the Middle East, the two were considered the watchdogs of the region. They were referred to as the two pillars that had a lock on the region. Huge military apparatus absolutely re repressive dictatorship. And Iran had enormous oil and gas deposits, brought great wealth to U.S. and Western banks. And it brought great poverty to the people of Iran. The 1979 revolution in Iran was really one of the greatest social upheavals, people's revolutions of the modern period. And the entire U.S. military machine and all of its agents and the royal family were expelled. And the oil was nationalized. And it began to be used for the development of the country and its infrastructure. And it made enormous difference. Even under sanctions, Iran has modernized into a state with full health care and education and modern cities, infrastructure. In the face of three decades of U.S. sabotage and coup attempts and economic strangulation. But the greatest fear in all this time was that the Iranian revolution would shake the totally corrupt royal house of Saud and the emirs and sheikhs of the Gulf states, that they would be overthrown as the Shah of Iran was overthrown. That was the fear. And it still is. That is so true. The so-called royal houses were actually pirates who were placed on thrones in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Bahrain and Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. We're talking about right here. Saudi Arabia, Oman, here's Doha, Bahrain, Kuwait. by British and then by U.S. imperialism. And they were more than willing to collaborate with U.S. imperialism to maintain their family position. But they're only able to do so through massive in 
in infusion of military intervention that's been used to hold them together. President Carter, in what became known as the Carter Doctrine, proposed building a whole series of U.S. bases in the Gulf as a way to block the influence of the Iranian Revolution and to hold these hated and corrupt monarchies up. Now that base building, and that was a concrete proposal at the time, a whole series of bases was continued even more aggressively under President Reagan, and then Bush won, then Clinton, and so on. The US military has built an unprecedented constellation of bases that stretches from southern Europe to the Middle East to Africa to Southwest Asia. And now, what is the Obama administration's proposal for dealing with the region? It is to create a new, new, an enduring system of military bases around the Middle East. It's not new at all, but it does mean they're even going to further expand this idea. And it's terrible repression that comes with it. Now, let's talk about the war in Iraq, right next to Iran. There isn't time to even discuss the wet role that the U.S played in the Iran-Iraq war where Kissinger said I hope they kill each other and gave arms to both in an effort to weaken and pull down both countries. But the US invasion with more than 100,000 troops in 2003, they called it at the time shock and awe. They, they looted every government ministry completely ruined it, pulled even all the records, the files, everything. Fired all the officials, except the oil ministry. U.S. oil corporations wanted that information. And as in Afghanistan, U.S. occupation found they had not a moment's peace. There was resistance in every form. The U.S. response to this resistance was to use sectarian violence to try to divide the whole population. Sunni, Shia, Christian, every ID card knew what religion, every government ministry, all the payoffs and money were based on a whole series of new political parties that were created that represented one sectarian group or another. Suddenly, there were religious fanatics also who had no past history or roots in Iraq who appeared to further divide the population. That was the basis of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Now, why is the U.S. in Iraq? Why are they fighting in Syria? Why did they destroy Libya? The oil had been nationalized in the 1960s and 70s in revolutionary upheavals. And anti-imperialist Arab nationalism was a strong political force with deep feelings. Once the Soviet Union was no longer a protective shield, there was a determination to grab everything back and no weapon they weren't willing to use. Now before the 2003 invasion and occupation of Iraq, the U.S. had tried another form and that was all-out war and bombing in 1991. And at the time, they felt they didn't have enough forces on the ground to actually invade Iraq, but they hoped they would be able to bring down the entire state through sanctions and by completely destroying the infrastructure. That's what the 1991 war was about. And it was a rude awakening that even though they had destroyed so much the Iraqi state was able to survive and Iraqi Arab nationalism was determined not to give up on the nationalized industries and the oil and the gas. Before these wars, Iraq was a modern developing country. They had free health care. We should never stop saying this. Full literacy, potable water, electricity, irrigation, roads, modern industry. Now it is what they call a failed state. It means in the cities when it's 110 degrees, there isn't electricity for a fan, for pumping water, 
some of the major parts of the city will have electricity three hours a day or if you're rich enough to have a generator. So every time they use this term failed state, it's a way of those that they themselves have destroyed to say it's your fault. And they'll also describe endlessly in all the sectarian wars they've used that there's endless ancient ethnic hatred among groups. This is a complete creation of US wars. Now, I want to move to U.S. war in Libya, in North Africa. The U.S. destruction of Libya was probably one of the most vicious of the U.S. wars in the region. Nine months of non-stop, seven months of non-stop bombing by the U.S., France, Britain, Germany, Belgium, Italy, Canada, bombarded also from the Mediterranean, naval, naval blockade and bombardment, cruise missiles. The most modern country in Africa was totally destroyed. A country, you see, Libya has a long coastline and a lot of the oil right, right here, but in other parts too, further inland. But more than 80% of the population lived on the coastline. It's a very arid country. And part of the modernization was something they called the Great Man-Made River, which was to actually tap the aquifer, the underground water. And it did make the desert bloom and the cities were viable, and not just potable water, but it developed industry. We should never forget Hillary Clinton on the TV interview, clapping her hands and laughing when it was announced that Omar Gaddafi had been brutally assassinated, lynched really, in the most horrendous way. And what did she say? She said, we came, we saw, he died. That level of vicious cynicism and ego at destroying such a country. Now, there's been no effort to rebuild Libya. There's oil is 20% of the production that it was, formerly. But for the people, there's really nothing remaining. Almost a third of the population are refugees in Tunisia and across the Mediterranean desperately as refugees. There's no government. There's a, a warring groups of pirates who are each trying to make their own deal. And in the midst of this, what happened? last week. U.S. announced it was again bombing Libya. And that this would be a sustained campaign. It's unclear whether, and there has been a resurgence of uh, the Green Movement, Jamaria Movement. They say it's against ISIS, but we shouldn't believe that any more than we believe it in Syria. And since the destruction of Libya, Two-thirds of the countries of Africa, there's now AFRICOM, which is the U.S. NATO forces, and bases. This, there was not one U.S. base in Africa before the conscious destruction of Libya. As a matter of fact, there was great optimism because Libya had pledged an enormous amount to create a new African currency and was helping development projects all over Africa. So this brings us to two wars going on right now, Syria and Yemen. And we'll close on this. Here's Syria, and here's Yemen down here. Syria, very developed, modern and nationalized industries, and Yemen, desperately poor, but right here at the mouth of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden very crucial place. Now, the war in Syria did not begin, as it's repeated endlessly in the media, with the Arab Spring. It really began, there have been U.S. sanctions on Syria since 2003, and some but going back earlier. Before the military overthrow, 
And in, in WikiLeaks, there was a whole trove of information that the Washington Post later covered, talking about a decade of developing alliances and training forces for the present war, and who they were buying off, and what forces they had. Emboldened by the vicious victory in Libya, the US media announced that the war in Syria would succeed and regime change carried out, a new government would be established in two weeks. Said there was no way Syria could survive. And then it was two months. And the deadlines kept being moved and moved. The people of Syria have held out now more than five years. But it is a grim and difficult, determined struggle. And in this, U.S. has not only used their military weapons, but they use social media to present the very reactionary and mercenary forces and religious sectarian forces that they have armed and inflamed. They're always referred to as the progressive, democratic alternative. That's how they describe al-Nusra and each of these groups. And they say again and again, that this armed mercenary invasion won't end until there is regime change, until the government steps back. They want for Syria what they've done in Iraq and in Libya. We support the Russian and Iranian and Hezbollah assistance to Syria. Syria has every right as a sovereign country, even under the UN Charter, to call for assistance and to defend itself against such an invasion, such an effort at overturn. And we also oppose every one of the imperialist bombings of Syria. We've heard again and again from the Obama administration that who they're bombing is ISIS. And yet they seemed unable, actually for a year they were bombing ISIS, just laying havoc to the infrastructure in Syria, and they were unable to scratch ISIS until Russian forces came in. That was a game changer, but not totally, because it just stepped up and ramped up what they were putting in on the ground. And these confrontations are extremely dangerous. Now, I also just want to touch on where does ISIS come from? Where does this force that they say can't be defeated and is setting up a new caliphate and is in Iraq and in Syria, they, they want to go back into, Sy into Iraq, no doubt about it, and to convince the people of Iraq that they are the only protection, that without it, the government will collapse and the only choice is ISIS or US bases. That is the message again and again. Here's a quote from Hillary Clinton. Again, this was WikiLeaks, but it says so much. She said, arming Syrian rebels and using Western air power is a low cost, high payoff approach. I don't, I don't think you can get much clearer. <laughs> and that's really what the war is about today. But you wouldn't know it when all of these social media campaigns will show an image of a Syrian young boy, blood on his face. Now, the very videographer called himself a media activist who shot this. There was all kinds of coverage as to who he really was because his Facebook and YouTube and Instagram, Twitter messages had shown him for quite some period of time supporting the very mercenary forces and a fanatical group, the Mulki, I think is the name of the, this force, um, that had been responsible just a month before and it created outrage. And he, some of the same people that are in his videos were in the video uh, actually decapitating a Palestinian Syrian young boy about 12 years old. And that created an outrage. So here's the same media activist videographer suddenly with this picture of a Syrian youth saying if there isn't US intervention, if there isn't bombing, if there isn't a free fire zone, then 
this terrible crime will continue. This is war propaganda. And it's important for us to see it, recognize it, stand up to it, do our best to expose it. Let me talk about Yemen, right here, sharing a long border with Saudi Arabia. There was an uprising in Yemen against the dictator in Yemen. There was a political movement, the Ansarullah movement. It blocked with other forces. And the aspiration was simply to write a new constitution and call elections and combine with all the political forces that felt absolutely hemmed in and locked down by the dictatorship. And against this, the dictatorship was overthrown. And then in came Saudi Arabia. They're going to put that old government back in place. And they began a bombing of a country that is the poorest, probably along with Afghanistan, a few others, underdeveloped, short life expectancy, a very underdeveloped country, and desperately short of water also. They bombed four hospitals of Medicine Sin Fronteras, or Doctors Without Borders, in the recent period, forcing Doctors Without Borders to announce they were pulling out of Yemen. Why would they pull out? It's not a small thing if you can't ensure the safety of your own medical personnel and technicians and the operating rooms and emergency rooms and the maternity wards and so on. But, but why bomb a hospital? They, they didn't want any Western observers. They didn't want those internet uplinks. They didn't want that contact with the outside world. They want to make this a free fire zone. That's why in Afghanistan, the U.S. said, oh, we made a mistake when they bombed a medicine sin fronteras, Doctors Without Border Hospital in Afghanistan, in an area there where they were determined to retake the province. They wanted to get rid of the wit witnesses, any Western witnesses, anyone who could send out a different message of what was happening. Now, did Saudi Arabia bomb these hospitals? Who's running the GPS, the satellite, refu refueling the jets, carrying out the naval blockade? I mean, look at the coastline of, of Yemen. The US Navy is responsible for this naval blockade. Now, resistance in Yemen very much continues under the same grim conditions we should take note that it does in Syria that it does in Palestine, and that it does in Iraq, and in many other countries. Our role here is to oppose every one of these US bases, every one of these US wars. Even if we know nothing about any of these countries, nothing about its history, and to again and again stand up to the social media campaigns that tell us this country is different. In this country, the US wants to help democracy. This time in Syria, or this time in Iraq, or this time, there is no progressive role that US bases play in any of these countries. And they rely on the most corrupt allies and collaborators in every one of their wars. They fight these wars with no hope or expectation of rebuilding the countries. And that's also important to recognize. They always promise it, that their intervention will bring an end to a failed state, will bring reconciliation, will bring modernization. They're unable to deliver on any of this. When we say capitalism is just a dead end, that it is, its, its whole role, its policy is to loot every state and to build a military machine stronger and stronger to encircle Russia, encircle China, and plan for new wars. That is the only policy that the Pentagon is considering. They don't go in with humanitarian workers. They go in with PR firms, yes, but they don't go in with any real hope of change. 
where wars are enormously profitable. Even when they completely lose the wars, create disaster, they're enormously profitable. Uh, I want to end on a on a good note because it shows one more form in which in which people's resistance and resistance picked up around the world can change in small ways and large can inspire we want to talk about the occupation of Palestine that continues to this day and the resistance that continues to this day and the Palestinians who have long experience in standing up even under the most horrendous prison conditions or the conditions in Gaza. Now, I think everyone here knows how many weeks the demonstrations against G4S, the security firm, and particularly the demonstrations for Bilal Qayyad, who's a Palestinian hunger striker, who was on a fast for literally to, to death it was more than 70 days. I hope really that, that Joe will say more on this. Or but, Nick. pardon? Or Nick. Yes, or Nick. Um, but there was an announcement today of that he would be released at the end of this administrative detention. See, and, and he won that because forces all over the world held demonstrations, made demands. We should be more confident of our role and also we need to be more confident of our ability to tie these wars all over the world to the war right here. To connect the role of the police to the role of the US military. To really raise, abolish the police, abolish US and NATO military, abolish the US war machine. Thank you discussion. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is um, U.S. imperialism is very powerful, but we should keep in mind that everything does not always go according to plan. And, you know, in the space of a few minutes, and I spoke more than a few, um, it was really about U.S. wars, but we could talk about the resistance that has set back U.S. wars again and again. I, I want to talk about those two pillars that at one point they thought would uphold the entire region, both Iran and then came the Iranian Revolution. Now Israel, they felt, could, and its purpose was to be their army, their stable aircraft carrier in the entire region. And Israel has been unable even to crush the Palestinian movement. They invaded Lebanon. It was a disaster. There was an aroused movement that really absolutely pushed them out. They tried again. We should, this is why Hezbollah is, is it's burned into their you know, mind, really. Uh, we could talk about one struggle after the other. There was once a big um, wheeling Air Force Base in Libya, and, and it was with the uh, Colonel Gaddafi and a, and a coup of, of um, young military forces that pushed out the U.S. You know, big. Air, it was the largest air base in Africa at the time. So there, there are so many, 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 many other things that uh, really could be brought into this. But just to say that it doesn't always go according to plan. They have endless plans. They have think tanks with plans. They have bases and yet they're not keeping a very good hold on their empire and the reason for all these US bases is that their collaborators are having a really hard time. Saudi Arabia thought they would be finished in a week in Yemen. They would be able to bring this down and we see this war has gone on and on and and actually the um, Resistance forces in, in Yemen, so it's charged, have been able increasingly to fire into Saudi Arabia. So, uh, you know, we, we should keep in mind that, that these wars don't go according to their plans. And I'm, I'm so glad that, um, really, it was raised. See, one part of demonization, this is, how, this is, this is a form of absolute racism. The U.S. never says, really, that they're bombing Iraq. They were bombing Saddam Hussein again and again and again. And that, that um, makes it possible for people not to see 
the Iraqi people on the ground. It was the same thing. They were bombing Gaddafi and they had thoroughly demonized this monstrous dictator, this brutal da 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 da, and completely ignored the political movement, the cultural advances. It isn't just in, in education and literacy, but there is a participation that comes with it and a, and a rich culture that's built up. Uh, and it, that doesn't get wiped out overnight either. So um, they're sometimes able to overwhelm it, but not totally, totally crush it. So I'm, I'm glad that um, Nick raised th those movements that continue to really show resistance uh, and, that, and that we should know will we'll sort of push forward again. They take new form, just like the um, absolutely reactionary forces that the US media, they'll give a different name, but it's the same core. It's the old landlord and, and completely corrupt and, and feudal elements that want to maintain their property relations who are fighting against people's movements. It takes different forms. Um, now, Heather raised this question on Turkey, and there have been actually a, a number of articles in, in Worker's World, but, uh, but let me say how complicated this is. Um, now, let's look at this map. See, here's Turkey, a piece of it, a foot of it, a part of Europe, and then across the Bosporus and, and the Black Sea on one side, the Mediterranean on the other, and the largest part in Asia. Uh, for more than 60 years, Turkey has been part of NATO, a member of NATO and a collaborator in these wars, in terms of the ruling class, in terms of the Turkish military. Uh, but there also have been big movements from below, and left movements, and communist parties, and other, other political movements, and religious movements. So there's uh, um, a, an enormous ferment. The US fears it, and they have people waiting in the wings, if one politician f falls, can they put forth another? That was really the role of, of Golan. They thought they had someone in their back pocket who had supporters there. Uh, we don't know how much the US was involved in this coup or if it was forces that they were aligned with both parts. But the wars have been enormously destabilizing, even to their allies. I mean, there are millions of refugees now in Turkey. Turkey had their largest amount of trade before this war five years ago with Syria. And that's completely broken. Uh, and, and with the region as a whole. Now, forces in the Turkish ruling class went along with this war. They thought they could quickly benefit from war in Syria and, and be part of this new regime that they sought to impose. It hasn't worked out that way. So that's destabilizing. Um, and, and we can't um, make an exact projection of where this is going. Uh, because Turkey, on the one hand, they want to maybe reach and stabilize some kind of an arrangement with Russia, which is no longer the Soviet Union. I mean, there's a a, a capitalist class that they want to make their own maybe accommodation. Uh, the problem every one of these countries face is that they're also targeted endlessly by the US wars. So it's not so easy f for them. They're being destabilized by the very ferment that's going on and the ferment in their own country. So this isn't an exact uh, response to the question. Uh, and, and each of them would take a, a whole talk. Um, very important. Walter brought up, you know, the and the no-fly zone and the effort to implement this, and now all but putting it in place, while not exactly. I mean, what is what they call the bombing of ISIS? Again and again, the U.S. is using whole parts of Syria as a free fire zone, but not really bombing ISIS. Do you remember? Putin holding up pictures of, of oil trucks stretched a thousand trucks long. They were untouched. Uh, and going directly into Turkey. There's a Kurdish struggle 
which again and again has been played off. Um, and certainly in Iraq, where um, U.S. imperialism presents itself as a protector of the Kurdish struggle. And yet there's a, a real Kurdish struggle in Turkey, where the largest number of the Kurds live. And the role of U.S. imperialism historically over decades and decades is again and again to use the Kurdish struggle in every one of these countries um, and, and to form relationships and then break. Um, and, and yet the Kurds are really an oppressed nationality without their own nation state, the largest actual um, oppressed nation in the world that does not have uh, a national um, state that represents them in any way, but rather divided up in the region, divided up by Sykes-Picot, divided up by the imperialists as to where the borders would lie, as happened in so many African countries too. And they, they use this, uh, if I were actually talking, we should talk about Sudan, largest number of refugees, and, and the U.S. created this South Sudan. It's a howling disaster today. It hasn't been a moment of stability. They, they brought back whole captive peoples who had been educated by missionaries back to South Sudan, but, but the country is all divided, this, this piece, because it was oil rich, they wanted to break up Sudan, and it gave them a foothold in Africa. That was a purpose. It wasn't helping the people of South Sudan. So it doesn't matter where we're, which country we're talking about, each of them has a rich, rich history has had people's movements, has had resistance, and has also had those forces who are willing to collaborate uh, with imperialism. And we, we constantly both study this. We're not experts in it. We don't speak the many different languages. Uh, and, and this is its own problem. We, we can't possibly follow what's actually happening on the ground. But in every situation, we would say the same. U.S. out that there's nothing progressive that U.S. imperialism will bring. And, and so that, that one message is a contribution. That one message, we, we've done also, we've tried to send, I'm so glad that Monica raised the delegation to Milwaukee, where we could talk about the delegation to Attica when it was really held by the prisoners themselves, right into Attica. Uh, and to so many cities where there are rebellions. Monica and Ferguson, uh, during those demonstrations and the lines of the National Guard and the police, uh, that's part of our tradition. And the same tradition to send solidarity delegations and organize it with a lot of other groups to Palestine during both intifadas, uh, to Libya, to Iraq. Uh, so many times, I remember the, the sanctions delegations where we tried to pull in every force, lawyers groups, religious groups, Catholic worker, all, all different um, bishops, all, all different forces um, with, with Ramsey Clark on those trips. To Iran, <coughs> how many times? To Syria, four delegations during these five years of war under very dangerous conditions. Uh, to South Africa under apartheid. So uh, these, just like we would stand with forces here in resistance, and when it's difficult, and the, when the media is all over denouncing and demonizing a struggle, we want to do the same with every one of these struggles around the world. Sometimes we can't go, but we try to, we look for ways to bring those struggles alive but the, but the purpose of sending sometimes even a few people is to bring back a living message here of, of resistance, let's say, and of, of the Palestinian organizations or the determination of, of people in Syria to resist and so on. So um, it really is part of international solidarity and it's very much linked to our uh, view of the struggle here also. Thank you. This is really a dividing line in the movement, uh, very much so. And there was an important uh, message that just went out today nationally, uh, an email. We were very much part of drafting it from the United National Anti-War Coalition, responding to a letter in, in these times, uh, which was defending um, the Syrian, you know, 
what they said were democratic forces, and we said, no such thing. And this statement from UNAC, which was signed by all the members of the coalition, and they're going to uh, get a lot of other signers nationally, and, and we're going to help and be part of that also, uh, was to say, no, this is one more U.S. war, and the only solution is, is U.S. out. So I, I do want to urge everyone to look at this statement put out by the United National Anti-War Coalition. Uh, read it and, and help send it to others and think about if you're in touch with any organization where you can sign on, even for identification purposes. Uh, it's very important and helpful. Thank you. <laughs>